we are live now right. um, good morning respected faculty and uh, dear delegates uh, we are again here with the next session of the dermatology module today we have dr pankaj gurg he is senior consultant in department of neonatology at institute of child health sir gangaram hospital delhi uh, today the session is on the neonatal skin care and common dermatological conditions in newborns uh, as he is a neonatologist himself so he will be speaking from the perspective of a pediatrician so we welcome dr pankaj gurg and thank you best here to start his presentation good morning friends <clears throat> So a warm, warm welcome from IIP Delhi platform. I know that uh, in Delhi it is very cold, but I'm sure uh, overall there are a lot of people around the country and the weather will be different at different parts. Today we are here uh, for a topic which is very, very important from a common pediatrician perspective or common neonatologist perspective. As has been introduced already, I am a neonatologist. And I'm doing neonatal practice for last 30 years in a uh, shoot of child health at Gangaram Hospital. And uh, I'll be discussing mainly from a neonatologist or a pediatrician perspective this issue of neonatal skin care and common dermatological conditions. So let me give you a disclaimer in the beginning that there are a lot of skin disorders, skin care issues which are involved in newborn. But most of the conditions are physiological and they need to be cared with love and tender care. You don't require the help of dermatologist usually in your practice. I can say with confidence in the last 30 years of my neonatology practice, I have not called a dermatologist to come to an ICU or to look at a newborn even 30 times. So even not once a year you need help of a dermatologist for neonatal disorders. So fortunately, the neonatal disorders are transient and they resolve on their own. And usually there is a communication which is required to solve the query of the parents. But nevertheless, we have to know them with confidence. And at times, you need to go in more depth and call your dermatologist colleague for help. I'll be discussing a lot of neonatal skin care issues, which are very, very important from day-to-day -day practice point of view. And I may assure you that at the end of this presentation, you will have a lot of myths busted, a lot of issues resolved, a lot of things to change in your practice. So that is my motive. Once you go out from this session at 10 o'clock, you have something to stick to your mind, which you're going to start practicing from tomorrow itself so that neonatal care of these babies can improve. So with this preamble, I just start the presentation. You know, skin care in newborns, my key points will be how we can preserve the skin barrier, how we can reduce the risk factors which can destroy the skin barrier, the skin care education, and then common neonatal conditions. Now, you will agree with me that the newborn is not a mini child and a child is not a mini adult. So, it's our newborns are different. They are different because from skin perspective also, there are 10 to 20 layers in adults in stratum corneum. But newborn, even a full-term newborn is 30% thinner, around 6 to 7 layers only. If you talk about preterm newborns, it has only, only got two to three layers. That is why I'm sure all of you pediatricians have seen newborns born, born around 24, 26, 28 weaker. And they're just skin. You can see the veins. You can see the drum is behind so thin skin. So why it is important to know this fact? Because preterm newborns have lesser layers. So more fluid and heat loss. Electrode imbalance. That is why we use incubators. That is why we use humidified atmosphere. That is why now NRP recommends that a baby who is born preterm, especially if it is born less than 30 weeks, you need to use a plastic wrap around them to reduce the water losses. Thermoregulation is a big issue. That is why all baby newborns are kept in a humidified atmosphere and which is also thermocontrolled. And this skin, which is very thin, also increases the risk of infection. I assure you that if you take care of skin better, your healthcare associated infections in your NICU are going to go down. 
So whether it is a cannulation in the skin, whether it is abrasion of skin because of use of adhesives, we you use a, a tagadam, we use a dinoplast to fix the endotracheal tube or fix the nasogastric or orogastric tube. Once you wipe it off, the skin comes along and then there is the skin is risk of infection. Even dermis is thinner underdeveloped in newborns. So why we are so worried about the newborn skin is that ultimately we understand that skin is not only a cover. It has got multifaceted structure. It has got four important functional barriers. So I understand that we always think skin is a physical barrier, which is true because it gives you direct exposure to the inner organs is not possible because of the skin. And you also know this is the largest organ of the body, but it is not only a physical barrier. It is also a microbe barrier. On the top of it, we have got healthy microbes, common microbes which make it possible because microbes have double functions. They have got immunological functions also. They prevent against infection also. Then there's a chemical barrier, which is because of the pH. Newborns are born with a pH of 5.5. So this acidic mental also prevents infection. Then there's a physical barrier, definitely. And then immune barrier. That means just beneath, we have mast cells, macrophages, killer cells, derma DC cells, which are important for lymph node migration and T cell priming. So what we are trying to say is that don't take skin lightly. Skin is important and we need to really take care of skin so that these issues can be resolved amicably. Now, skin microbe is a new chapter, new frontier in science of infant skin care. Why? Because now we know that these microbes which are there on the skin, they have a critical role in maturation of immune system. Immune system, we already know there are two types, innate immunity, which you are born with, and adaptive, which we adopt over a period of time. So innate immunity, because of these microbes, especially the staph epidermidis, which implies the skin response to pathogens and inhibit inflammation. So we should not try to remove the skin common bacteria. I'm sure as a pediatrician, as a neonatologist, parents will ask you that if there is infection, risk is very high in newborns, should we clean the baby skin routinely with Dettol soap or for that matter any antiseptic soaps or should we use chlorhexidine routinely or we should use betadine routinely in newborns? The, my answer is no. If you're using that, you're actually harming the baby because you're taking care of, you're taking away the commensal bacteria also, which is deleterious because these commensal bacteria have a beneficial role to play. We don't want to remove them. If you use antiseptic regularly, skin will be colonized with the resistant bacteria, which will cause more harm. Also, adaptive immunity, because skin microbes, they also control T cell functions and help shape pathways and players of regulatory immune responses and immune tolerance. So we should really take care of skin microbe very well if we really want to take care of the health of the newborns at large. Now, skin microbes differs from that of adult. And diversity keeps on increasing over a period of time. In newborns, you have more firmicutes and very less of actinobacteria and bacteritis. But as you grow older, the firmicutes become much, much lesser and the bacteroids and actinobacteria, they become more. So we have to preserve the infant skin microbe because the baby is born with other immunity is not very good. You know that they get more infections because their T cell function, the phagocytic functions, the complementary functions are not as good as that of a pediatric or adult patient. But skin microbes are there to help the baby overcome that deficiency which baby is born with because of its own limitations. So let us see what can we do to make sure that the baby skin microbe is preserved. First of all, the mode of delivery, you understand that the Natural childbirth, that means through vaginal route, gives the baby microbe of which of vaginal colonizers. So that is why babies who are born through the uh, vaginal route have uh, lactobacilli more common, the, uh, the bifidobacteria brevi more common on their skin. But if the baby is born through cesarean section, then the baby has more got staph. And it is very well known that if baby is born through vaginal root, it is more likely to have a healthy microbe, which have a protective effect throughout life, including as long as obesity later on in life. So born through vaginal root, which I understand that uh, LSCS rates are increasing in the country, 
But as a neonatologist, it's our responsibility to convince the obstetricians that presenteral birth has its own advantages. Skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother, which is commonly called kangaroo mother care or kangaroo father care or kangaroo parent care. KPC, which should be the ideal word because we don't want to differentiate between mother and father as far as skin-to-skin -skin contact is concerned. So that is also gives the baby the skin microbe of the mother. Contact with family members, caregivers, and then skill care routines, which produce with products which clinically proven to nurture skin microbes. So now this is what we are coming to. We want a vaginal birth. We want a skin-to-skin -skin contact with mother. And we also want to nourish those skin care routines which improve, clinically improve and nurture skin microbe. Let us see them one by one. <clears throat> All these issues, I'm sure you know, you do it day to day, but I'm sure there are certain changes which needs to be done, updated here. Umbilical cord care. First of all, we always used to say that keep the cord area open and dry because over a period of time, we have seen, like me, I have seen this 30 years my, of my neutral practice that newborns used to come with the cow dung or for that matter, any powder or anything which is applied onto the umbilical stump, which leads to omphalitis infections. Now, we don't want to do that. We want to keep the cord area open and dry. And this is from NNF Clinical Practice Guidelines 2010. Not even alcohol wipes are recommended. So, but what will happen if the suppose cord is soiled with urine or stool? Then you can clean this with water. This is the information I want to give it. I have seen with my residents, they will say that no, water is not recommended. So, it's water is very much recommended as a cleansing agent for the umbilical cord if the it is soiled with urine or stool. And you can also use a pH neutral cleanser. Important thing is, I have seen this that the nappy or the diaper which is wound around the perineal area, normally it covers the umbilical cord stuff. It's very clear cut written that fold the nappy down below the umbilicus. So the umbilicus cord clamp should not be in the nappy. Otherwise, whatever baby passes urine or stool, there is chances that the umbilical cord uh, will be uh, uh, will be soiled by that. We want we don't want to remove cord clamp. Now many time parents will say doctor we go to the house first that is not recommended. Cord clamp may remain in situ until separation. Important to our point is that a full-term newborn, the quiet cord should fall within 14 days maximum. If it does not fall beyond 14 days, then there may be a concern, especially we know that leukocyte adhesion defects can present like that. Also, you want to ex avoid exposing the periumbilical skin to chemicals. Uh, whether it is poidone iodine, whether it is uh, mercurochrome, whether it is any antiseptic, because ultimately we don't want to get into periumbilical burns. Also, it is important that regular assessment, whenever a newborn is coming to you for a checkup after discharge, before discharge every day, after discharge, every uh, discharge follow-up visit, you must look at the umbilical cord. And I'm sure you, all of you must have seen some bit of oozing of blood or some dead tissue coming out of there, which is normal. Because we know that the umbilical cord has become dead now and it will fall off over a period of time. But infection, which means purulent discharge, it is smelling, and you should also know that if something else like stool uh, without swelling, urine is coming out on umbilicus, it may indicate a patent vitro-intestinal duct or patent urecus. You should always be sure of that the discharge which is coming is just a dead infection or it is some urine stool, which may give you a very important clue as to a very differential diagnosis of PID or patent urecus. Now, very important to know that umbilical cord care has also undergone changes from the recommendation point of view. In 2014, World Health Organization released new guidelines on postnatal care, which, which include an update. What is that update? We always used to say umbilical cord should be kept dry. Don't apply anything. But it got changed in 2014, not for all, but for those situations in which a baby is born in home, and the NMR, the neutral mortality rate of that place or that city or that country is more than 30. So if the neutral mortality rate is more than 30, that means neutral infection is contributing uh, significantly to this NMR and the baby is born at home. If those things are there and the baby is visited by a healthcare worker or they come to a uh, healthcare facility, then daily chlorhexidine, 
which is 7.1% chlorhexidine in digluconate aqueous solution or gel, which delivers 4% chlorhexidine in application on umbilical cord is recommended during the first week of life. So I make it very clear it is not recommended for all. It is recommended only if the baby is born at home because we assume that at home the, the settings in which baby is born is not aseptic. And the NMR is high, meaning thereby in that state, sepsis is a significant contributor of NMR. Now we know that clean, dry cord care is recommended for babies born in health facilities and at home also in low neonatal mortality settings. In these settings, especially the low neonatal mortality settings, can you still use chlorhexidine? It may be considered, especially if the parents want to apply something. So there are harmful traditional practices for application of cow dung uh, to the cord stump. So in place of that, if the parents are bent upon this, then you can advise use of 4% chlorhexidine on the umbilical cord, even in babies born in hospital or born in places where there is low neonatal mortality. So I'm sure I made it very clear. 4% uh, chlorhexidine can be applied, but baby should be born at home or with high NMR. Or if in low MR, it can replace the harmful tradition practices. So for those who are practicing in hospital, it, uh, whether now we are looking at the NMR, which is right now 22 for the country. Delhi has a single digit NMR and many states have single digit like Kerala, Goa, Tamil Nadu. But if those states, if you are practicing, where NMR is very high, especially some, some of the states in the middle of the country and NMR is high, baby is born at home, comes to you for checkup, you can recommend chlorhexidine for daily for first week of life. Now let us come to the second point, cleaning of the baby at birth. Now there's a recent change which has happened in these guidelines. And enough clinical practice guidelines in 2010 said you can clean the baby with a clear sterile crow to remove blood clots and meconium. So that is that much is okay. You can clean. But you should not try to remove vernix from the body because it vernix is healthy. It provides, if you rub it off, it will, will cause trauma and it increases the risk of infection. But what about the most important factor? And that is bathing. The bathing recommendation has changed. Evidence-based guidelines, which was released in 2010, said no routine bathing in hospital because there is a risk of cross-infection and hypothermia. Instead, baby can be sponged. Now, that was recommended in 2010. And baby can be bathed at home once discharged. Now, these guidelines have changed. Guidelines have changed because WHO released its recommendations for newborn health in 2017, which got adopted by the government of India by National Guidelines for Infection Prevention and Control in Healthcare Facilities in 2020. So you can see this, I'm, that the now by the National Guidelines, it is recommended bathing in hospital. So you look into your own setups. How many of you are practicing this? I see many centers still not recommending bathing in hospital. Bathing or washing the newborn should be done once the temperature of the newborn has stabilized, usually by six hours of life. So within six hours, Baby's temperature is stable, you can bathe. And emphasis still remains on hand hygiene by healthcare workers and cleaning the diaper area. Why we have recommendations have changed? There are two things to it. Now, number one, the risk, they it used to be thought there is a risk of cross infection. So we are saying that hand hygiene practices should be adopted to prevent cross infections. Cross infection does not help uh, spread only through bathing. It spreads through all the practices. So once we are ensuring that healthcare practices are improved by hand hygiene, then even bathing is not a issue for cross infection. Other issue used to be that once you bathe the baby, there may be risk of hypothermia in the hospital, so which has now allayed because we want to make the baby stable. But still the issue remains whether you sponge or you do immersion bath, that means sponging is that use a sponge and clean. And immersion bath is you are in the pool of water or you're in a tub of water. Another is whether it really increases the risk of hypothermia. So let us look into that aspect. Now, this is neonates' first bath clinical experience. We know that neural thermoregulation is the primary consideration, but there are studies published show that post bath axillary and skin temperature bath at different time points at three hours six hours and nine hours don't differ 
if immediately after bathing the baby, you keep the baby skin to skin care. And that is what we are recommending. The skin to skin care of 60 minutes or more immediately after birth takes care of all the apprehensions which you may be having regarding hypothermia. So if the baby's temperature is stable, bathing does not increase the risk of hypothermia. And definitely kangaroo mother care is a good opportunity immediately after birth, immediately after bathing to improve the uh, skin care as well as to prevent hypothermia. Now, the other issue, sponge bath versus immersion bath. We understand that sponge bath is something which is you feel, you feel, we feel, we used to feel that it is safer. It is safer and there is less risk of uh, uh, hypothermia. But it has been shown to be contrary. Sponge bath has shown to have more risk of hypothermia, like 30% in this study of 142 babies, compared to immersion bath. Now imagine yourself in a five-star hotel in a water, uh, the, the tub, which is full of lukewarm water. Once you're inside that tub, you don't feel cold. But once you come out of the tub, then the water operates and you start feeling cold. In sponge, you're sponging the baby in normal atmosphere. And that sponge evaporation of water is more likely to cause hypothermia. So this is a myth which needs to be busted that immersion bath is better than sponge bath and that has been shown very, very clearly in this study. Now, immersion bath, the other issue could be that once you are immersing the baby in a, a lukewarm water, it may increase the risk of infection or the bacterial collation of glycal cord, which has been done with. We traditionally bath used to be done until the medical cord falls, which may take two to three to four weeks also. So that means should not be bathed till that time, especially immersion bath. And there is a, this is a misconception. People say that till the time the medical cord falls, keep on doing sponge bath because immersion bath will moisten the umbilical cord. It will take longer to fall. It has been shown here very clearly that there is no increased risk of infection or bacterial colonization even if you do immersion bath vis-a-vis -vis sponge bath. So both the groups showed similar uh, the way the code fell. So immersion bath, which less chances of hypothermia, is a recommended way of bathing. And that also is now recommended. We are saying swaddle bathing. Swaddle bathing means baby is wrapped in a sheet and then the wrap is removed gradually. And at the end, that time, we uh, at that time, we uh, unwrap and baby remains in the lukewarm water tub, which is a more physiological way. Baby cries less. So just remember the word swaddle. Swaddling the baby and keep it in the immersion bath. You can do a lot of videos on this. Swaddle bathing, immersion bathing is better as a method of uh, 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 taking care of the skin. So method of uh, bathing, I said, uh, the sponge and swaddle immersion bathing have been compared. And uh, in sponge bath, it takes more time. In some swaddle immersion bath, it takes lesser time. There are lesser steps involved. And most important is lesser crying. Once you sponge bath, the baby, baby cries. In the swaddle immersion bath, when the baby is swaddled in the sheet and in the bathtub, he cries less and it's more pleasurable experience for the baby. Bathing at home, bathing is preferred to washing with a cloth, a part of evening routine. Bathing will be considered to help improve sleep also. Frequency of bathing is usually two to three times a week. Why we don't do it every day? Because it will change the acid mental of the skin and should last five to seven minutes on routine. So, sweddal immersion bathing is a recommended way. Should not do it more than two times in a week and four to seven minutes on routine is good enough. Safety, I think bath should be close, bathing should be in a safer place, warmer temperature, depth of water should be till infant's hips, five centimeter, room temperature to 21 to 24. Baby should, be, should not be left alone in the bath and oils, Preferably should not be used at that time because if you use the uh, oil, there's more chances that uh, uh, you, and you baby may slip out of your hand. So uh, oil can be used after this or baby massage can be done. We'll discuss massage separately. And uh, we very definitely uh, younger children should not be allowed to ba wash the babies. So what about preterm babies? We can be done preterm also, especially the babies uh, uh, at the time of weighing the baby. You can do that for newborn less than 32 weeks gestation, warm water only in the first week. Do we don't uh, use rubbing more than 32 weeks. You can use a pH neutral or slightly acidic cleanser uh, and they also can be bathed every two to three days. 
warm style water when areas of skin break down are evident that is important that uh, it's not that the, those areas of skin break down you don't apply water you can still apply warm style water to clean it and if there is the skin is dry flaking then emollient may be applied to the skin immediately after so water alone or liquid cleanser so water alone is good enough yes it is good enough maybe me but recommendation is you can use it water alone or you can also use a appropriately formulated liquid cleanser which has a ph of 5.5 to 7 especially if the water quality is not if you are not sure sometimes babies are from that area where you are using hard water or normally people do they will use uh, the, uh, the the government water for drinking and they use the uh, the well water or uh, some the drilling water or the hard water so that should not be used that if you are using that then a uh, uh, liquid cleanser uh, it's is better than water alone how to take care of nappy? I'm sure the risk factors are you uh, there's more moisture in the nappy, prolonged contact with irritants, alkaline skin surface, frequent stooling, antibiotic uses if you're using that, malabsorption, opiate withdrawal, all these issues are there. So we try to change nappy every three hours. That is what's important. And a preventive uh, 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 solution can be applied so that nappy rash is not there. So we want to keep it clean and dry. Diaper needs to be changed at three to four hours gap. That is the most important part. And you can drying, so especially in winter season, you see a lot of napkin rash. So drying immediately after cleaning, taking care of perineal area, drying can be achieved through air drying or gentle patting with a dry towel, which I recommend to all. Air drying is very, very important to clean, keep the diaper area dry. And it should be cleaned before bathing. And then what could be used is similar as you should not use anything which contains alcohol or uh, fragrances, soaps, but uh, definitely wipe. Uh, if you want to use, you can use water or you can use a, a mildly acidic cleanser as we discussed. Powders, I'm sure most pediatricians will agree that powders are uh, no, no, but uh, what are the recommendations? I, APA, the American Pediatric Association recommends against using baby powder. The, mainly the concern was with talk, talc. Talc powder, which is a natural mineral ingredient of uh, traditional baby powder, uh, there was possible inhalational risk and potential harm to lungs, especially if you are sprinkling the talc powder and uh, uh, because it can be inhaled. But right now, we don't have talc powder. We have got cornstarch containing alternatives to traditional baby powder. But still, we don't want to uh, have that practice of using powders. If somebody is bent upon, no, I have to use powder, then you have to put the powder on the hands first, away from the baby, not directly or near him, not sprinkle. And then you don't allow powder to build up or pile up on the skin. And after every diaper change, you can wash away any powder that may have accumulated, especially in the baby's skin fold. So powder, preferably not. If you want to use, keep it on the skin like this and then apply it on the baby. Disinfectants, there is very little data, especially for preterm newborns. If you are recommending, if you are requiring disinfectant in less than 14 days of age or less than 30 weeks, you gently clean the skin with sterile water because nothing else is recommended. You know that for babies, you can recommend chlorhexidine gluconate aqueous solution, but uh, uh, that is also less than 30 weeks. It is uh, associated with burns. And uh, definitely you don't want to use poidone iodine because of the risk of hypothyroidism, which can be there. Emollients, simolients, they restore lipid levels, improve hydration, preserve natural um, and moisturizing effects. So emollient is always yes as far as skin care is concerned. Preterm newborns also, there's some evidence states that prophylactic emollients used in preterm newborns, especially in 750 grams or less, is associated with increased risk of infection. So because emollients in very small babies, there's some increased risk so that in this group, less than 750 gram, you may wait against the risk of infection. But otherwise, bigger babies, emollients can be used to take care of the dryness of the skin. So uh, overall, use of emollients has shown beneficial effect. There are studies on that. It helps in skin maturity, late onset sepsis reduction, hypothermia prevention, and also should increase serum vitamin D3 levels. Now, uh, Role of topical emollients in preterm infants. Uh, does it reduce sepsis and mortality? There are a number of trials. 2086 uh, new infants, there's shown no effect on infection mortality. 
but there are more trials and which have used plant or vegetable oils. I'm sure you must be heard, heard, hearing uh, Dr. Darmstadt's study on uh, Nepal. They used uh, sunflower oil. And when they used this, there was a reduced risk of invasive infections, though there was no effect on mortality. So if somebody says that they're using oil uh, for reducing uh, infections, especially in developed, developing countries, especially in Nepal, there is some evidence that it may help. Now let us come to another issue of massage. Massage has got some, several positive effects like weight gain, better sleep, wake pattern, neuromotor development, emotional bonding, reduced rate of nosocomial infection, reduced mortality in hospitalized patients, and long-term impact still is not known. So this is from our own IAP. This uh, has been published and shown that massage helps. But the effect on bone mineralization needs further evolution. We are not sure whether it really makes your bones stronger. But short-term benefits of decreasing the pain after uh, before the heel stick injury has been proved. So there is some beneficial effect on pain reduction also. What is definitely shown is that massage therapy helps weight gain. How does it do? Uh, usually people will say oil goes to the skin into the blood and you get weight gain. That's not true. Actually, massage helps to increase the vagal activity, which improves gastric mortality, better absorption of nutrients, and that is why there is better weight gain. So preterm infants who receive massage therapy 15 minutes for 5 days, they have shown increased level of serum insulin and serum insulin growth factor 1 levels and also reduces the stress, which means that massage therapy helps in weight gain through both ways, vagal activity as well as the, the serum insulin levels. How to massage? A conducive environment, 45 minutes to 1 hour after a feed to avoid regurgitation. The whole body should be involved, the head, neck, trunk. Most important is you should do it. The mother should do it, the father, not the massager. There are two phases of tactile stimulation. Baby is placed prone and 12 strokes of 5 seconds each is provided from head, neck, shoulder and then supine and 12 strokes again. And third phase is a kinesthetic stimulation in which alternate flexion extension of the major joints is done. So massage is a therapy. We should learn how to do it and then only we can teach the parents how to do it on a day-to-day -day basis. Which oil, which is the most important question asked, there is number of studies done on coconut oil, mineral oil, placebo in multiple uh, studies. But the emphasis is that coconut oil trials are many. And most of them are done in India and Pakistan, whether preterm babies or full-term babies, you can see a lot of trials done and all of them are showing a positive impact as far as the coconut oil is concerned. So we have meta-analysis on coconut oil trials, significant lower infection rate, decreased water loss, better weight gain, better skin condition and maybe better neurodevelopmental outcome also. So we recommend coconut oil. In the winters, you can warm the coconut oil if you are really scared of the, it becomes solid. Sesame oil also, there's some study to show greater improvement, but not many studies compared to coconut oil. Olive oil is no-no because olive oil contains oleic acid, which can, which has the potential to damaging the skin barrier and harmful. Mustard oil, it is okay if somebody is using it and there is no harm done. But if there is some eczema allergy seen with the use of mustard oil, it is possible because irritant reaction can be there. Why? It is not the mustard oil which is a fault. Maybe it is uh, the, there is some uh, uh, volatile chemical there like allyl isothionate, thiocyanate which may be an issue if uh, there's some allergies are happening. If it is there, definitely need to be changed. So there is positive impact seen or, or massage. And at that time, it has been shown that it's an effect on growth and development also, because at that same time, the mother is also talking to the baby. Developmental stimulation is also help, help, helping the baby. So multi-sensory stimulation is what is the most important thing to do. After that, let me come to the pure dermatological aspect. I'm sure you need to take care of the skin on a day-to-day -day basis. And for that, we have scores, neutral skin condition scoring, which is NSSC. We take care of three things, dryness, erythema, and breakdown. So you must, all newborns, especially in the NICUs, look into it, take a photograph, take, take if you want to uh, see it again, please see it again and start doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Because depending on the skin condition score, you know whether baby is... Having issue of the skin, baby needs moisturizing, lotion or not, baby needs to have better care. If there is dryness, erythema, as well as breakdown, definitely this baby is likely to get more infection. So you must start scoring your babies on daily basis. This is a very simple score. Each point has three points like dryness is one, two, three, normal, dry and very dry. 
Aridima, no uh, Aridima, visible Aridima, less than 50% and more than 50%. Breakdown, no breakdown, small localized areas and extensive breakdown. Very simple score to be used on day-to-day -day basis. Interpretation, a single score of three in one area is a problem and a combined score of six and more is a problem. What it does, it needs attention. It needs to be taken care of by us and then definitely some cases even dermatological reference is required. And we see this in routine practice if baby has been uh, in, uh, subjected to intensive care, multiple punctures have been done, then you have slaps, you have micro core attached, you have your dinoplast, skin is proved off. So this skin needs to be taken care of if you really want to cut down the healthcare associated infection in the country. Frequency of assessment you should need to do daily. And if there is a clinical indication, you may do it even more frequently. Neonates are increased risk of systemic infection and longer hospital stay will be identified promptly. That is what we do. I always say today's era, the newborn does not die of any other disease except infection. So infection is the commonest cause of neonatal death. Even preterm babies, they don't die like that. We can take care of respiration. We can take care of their uh, nutrition. But something which is still uh, not uh, allowing all babies to survive is the increased risk of infection. So apart from hand hygiene, apart from taking care of uh, good practices in NICU, what is lacking in today's NICU is the skin care. So if we do that, I'm sure it will make an impact on reduction of healthcare associated infection. There are uh, better tools also. If somebody wants to do research in this area, there are skin care assessment and management tools which are available. And this is an area which definitely needs more work and more research so that we start doing skin care better. So this is very extensive uh, skin care assessment and management tool for research purposes. Even this can be used. Now let us come to the skin lesions. I understand that uh, out of my uh, 50, 45, 50 minutes, I have taken a lot of time on the neonatal skin care because I feel as a neonatologist, as a pediatrician, these issues which we have discussed so far are important for us on a day-to-day basis. And skin lesions, which I will be discussing, and I also have Dr. Deepika Yadav with me uh, from uh, Kalavati Hospital. She will be helping us understand if there is any lesion which is more important, which I have left out of my list. So usually, the, you can divide the skin lesions into three types. Normal, which are transient, which resolves in minutes to hours. As you can see, malaria or heat rash, you see it. By the time baby has come to you, you unwrap the baby and after half an hour, the, those rashes have disappeared. Petiki, you can see them scalp and face after vertex delivery. I'm sure all of you must have seen subconjunctival hemorrhage in the eyes. You have seen some, some petiki here and there which was because of pressure and they resolve over a period of time, maybe hours. Vernix case user, which is there in the skin, which is not related to anything the mother eats, which is the common perception the mother has eaten this and that is why this is Vernix, does not. But full-term babies have more Vernix. As you become preterm, have lesser Vernix. And if you're very post-term, then also Vernix becomes lesser. There are also a transient vascular phenomena. Like cutis marmoratum, I'm sure all of you must have seen something like a mesh, mesh, like a web type of meshing on the skin, which is skin mottling related to cold exposure. So it does not require anything else but warming the baby or keeping the peripheries warm. Harlequin color change, I can see that uh, this is very much described in neutral books, but I can tell you in 30 years of my practice, I have seen only two babies. Only two babies in 30 years I have seen of harlequin color change, which means pollution edema on the dependent side of the body. You keep the baby on left hand side, the left side becomes red or little darker in color compared to the side which is upright. But uh, as the name suggests, it, it uh, disappears within minutes to hours. Now, other conditions are short term normal conditions, which results in days to months. I'm sure all of us see that. Ardima toxicum neonatarum, which is not a right term for this. This is not a toxic condition. This is a very normal condition. This is, uh, we'll discuss in more detail because this is a very common question of many uh, parents who are coming to what is these rashes come up. Neutral postular melanosis, that means they looks like pustules and they are maybe colored, like black colored, but they also disappear within days. Milia. The suckling blister, which normally the infant develops on the middle part when the baby is suckling, especially it is seen with breast 
suckling, they are suckling, they are suckling their own lips. They are suckling that, so there is a blister here. You don't break the blister. You don't do anything uh, about it. It gets sorted out on its own. Letting go fine here, especially in shoulders and back and face. I don't know whether it is prevalent in your part, but in Delhi and this part, there is a practice of applying upta, or they will apply something like a basin and mixed with something on the face, other parts of the body, with the belief that if they apply upta, the renugo gehir will go away. But I tell them that uh, we are uh, our ancestors were monkeys and chimpanzees, and they are here all around the body. It's only evolutionary process which has resulted in lesser hair. So don't do anything; it will go away, and it may be harmful also if you do that. There may be some skin contact, and you are removing the normal skin mantle, the acidic mantle of the skin. You are removing by applying anything like this, which is for a prolonged period of time. Spontaneous fat necrosis, we have seen that more commonly with the uh, babies who are subject to therapeutic hypothermia. And when you cool the babies, you can get fat necrosis, especially on the nape of the neck. I've seen it on the abdomen also. The only thing which should be scared if it is persisting for many days, it can lead to hypercalcemia. So that you should keep it in mind. Otherwise, it's not a problem. Acne, which is not there at birth, but comes in two to three weeks, especially in the same area where the acne of adults are seen. Usually acne is because of the mother's hormones, which have come to the baby. Don't do anything and they do all right, especially uh, because if the mother has got uh, acne herself or she had uh, this issue, then she understands that it does not require any treatment. Now, let us look at some of the normal birth marks which are likely to remain long term, persisting for mothers months to years and some don't resolve at all. Like we know Mongolian sports, which is now not called Mongolian sport, it looks like racist that you are believe you are saying that Mongolian, they, this is something related to some particular country or some particular place. So the right terminology is congenital melanocytic nevi or dermal melanosis. So you have seen this on large surface. This is a commonest which you see large bluish gray pigment patches on extremities, buttocks, lumbar, sacral, buttock area, and it occurs more with darker skin. And I've seen it. Some kids, children have it on the arms also, which remain for a very long period of time. Normally, I say that it will take two years before they go away. Actually, nothing goes away. The skin becomes thicker. You can't see them. The melanosis will remain, but it is covered with uh, the, the um, thicker skin and you can't see this. Neva simplex, you can always see a salmon patch on the face, macular pink to red capillary dilatation that fades with time. More, mainly seen upper eyelids, forehead and nape of neck, stroke bite, something like a trishul seen on the, on the head. Hemangiomas, uh, we see it more commonly in preterm babies. Uh, and as they grow, they become more and more common, the bigger. And it does not require any management if it is not on the face, face or a cosmetically appealing area, or they are not very big in size. So then they don't require any treatment. But yes, if required, this will this is easily done. So let us look at those abnormal lesions that may require evolution, like vesicles. Vesicles always are bad. You know, the vesicles. Uh, can be hinotal herpes, can be chicken pox. We have all seen chicken pox presenting in first year, month of age. But they are, these vesicles are water filled and they have an erythematous base, which is not there with erythema toxicum. We'll see the erythema toxicum in detail. Bulle are abnormal, definitely. A plesia cutis congenita, we also see uh, commonly, especially in the scalp, and there is a skin patch which does not contain any hair. And uh, it is a bit, the only problem it may be associated with the skull deformities. And that is why if it is a large area, you cannot feel a bone underly, then uh, x-ray, uh, especially a skull, can, needs to be done to look for uh, skull abnormalities. Port wine stain, which also is commonly seen, uh, only point is that if you are seeing it in the area of ophthalmic division, then you may have stretch member syndrome associated with this. So, uh, or if you, if you feel that uh, it is, uh, it's very huge, and uh, ophthalmic division is involved, then you may be uh, asked to get a uh, MRI or a CT scan for such Weber syndrome. So those which require evolution, uh, like uh, uh, something like a yellow hairless plaque on face or uh, scalp or face, which is nevus sebaceous, I have not seen it very commonly. Smooth muscle hematomas that also I have not seen, but cephalot spots 
are very commonly seen. So you can, what is kefalot? It is a coffee with milk-like color and their flat mucus less than 4 cm and usually we are not worried about them if they, we are worried about them if they are more than 6, 6 or more and uh, in pre-pubertal stage if they are more than 5 mm and post-pubertal more than 15 mm, then it's a problem. So I have not seen that happening in any newborn. So, so many kefalot spots to be of concern. So let us, uh, the list is huge, but I am trying to discuss only those which are commonly seen like Aridima toxicum neonatarum, which is a common condition as much as half of full-term newborns, they get it and uh, they get it more on the upper part of the chest, uh, the back, and they are not there on the at birth. They come up within, say, usually after 24 hours. And uh, but sometimes it can be as late also. They spread. Palms and soles are not affected. That is important. Palms and soles are not affected. They are various combination of erythematous macules and papules. Pustules look may look like pustule also, but there is no vesicles. There are no erythematous bases. And, and uh, it will last for several days. And whatever you do, they will go away on on their own. So it's, it does not require any treatment. And what I make them understand is that the parents, why it is happening, we always tell them that the, the birth baby is coming from absolutely sterile, pollution-free environment from mother's womb. When the baby is coming out in this environment, it is attacked by all the bacteria, all the dust, all the pollutants, and then the baby's reaction to all this stuff is what is causing these lesions. And over a period of time, skin becomes sensitive and these lesions go away. Don't apply anything. That is the most important thing. Now, neonatal milia, I'm sure all of you must have seen. It also affects uh, a lot of uh, newborns, uh, around 40 to 50 percent. They are harmless cysts. As you can see, they are harmless cysts, which appear in the tiny, pearly white bumps just under the surface of the skin. They are often seen on nose, but they also be there in the mouth. I'm sure all of you have seen upstream pulse on the mucosa mouth or palate also, which is called bohun nodules. On palate, they are a little more uh, thickish. Uh, more and they can be seen on scalp, face and upper lesions also. This is also something which heals over a period of time or within a few weeks of life and you don't have to do anything. If they really bother you, then you can always ask them to gently rub these areas and the harmless is they will go away. Uh, then folliculitis uh, or which is also called an acne which affects baby within first few weeks, not in the, usually not in the first week, it happens after a week, 10 days. That's because of the newborn sebaceous glands, which causes inflammation and folliculitis because of the mother's hormones. They are something like what we have seen uh, acne in uh, adolescents, dome-shaped papules. Uh, they are always in crops, mainly cheek, nose, and forehead. And it's not EG. The child is not affected by this. So that is important that from atopic dermatitis or something like eczema, which is always itching condition. It normally resolves uh, without treatment, but sometimes if the parent persists or if they're too much, you can apply ketoconazole shampoo, uh, which is available, uh, diluted 1 is to 5 with water. You can apply it with a cotton bud twice a day and rinse of water after 10 minutes and because over a period of time, this goes away. Usually should not be a problem. Malaria or heat rush, rash, we have guys from occlusion of sweat glands in newborns and as the tendency is to wrap them a little too much and which leads to these papules or vesicles, papules-like structure. And if you remove the baby from heated environment, humid environment, and adjust incubator temperature because sometimes the incubator is too hot, then also it can happen. You can clean those areas, cool bathing or apply cold compresses, it helps. And if it is uncomfortable, you can always use topical steroids to facilitate relief when the condition resolves. So we have a full session on hemangioma next time. So that is why I'm not discussing hemangioma in detail. Thanks, Dr. Ajay, for that information. Uh, cradle cap. Cradle cap is quite common. That also is not seen right at birth. It's seen after two, three weeks. Usually at that time when the child is coming to back to you for follow-up. They are thick white or yellow scales. Uh, sometime it can also happen in back of neck, diaper area, armpits, eyelids and more. It is only made worse by oils and lotion. That is what is the common perception. You will say that credit cap, apply oil, it disappears. It disappears because it's not visible. It's white. It is covered with oil. That is what is not visible. But actually oils harm this. So why it's happening? It is basically overproduction of sebum, which is our oil. 
oily substance naturally occurring on the skin and that keeps the skin moisturized. So basically what you want to do, you want to remove the scales with soft brush and washing with a dandruff shampoo. Uh, if it is too much and very yellow, dark, uh, yellow color, you can always use a ketazoconocal shampoo also, but even mild dandruff shampoos daily for one or two weeks are good enough to use it. And ultimately it will go away. The only problem is when the cradle cap goes away, it takes hair along with it. But don't worry about that. The hairs will come back. I'm sure all of you also know that uh, newborns shed a lot of hair, which is called telogen effluvium. And these hair also come back over a period of time. So don't worry about cradle cap. Just apply, just ask them not to use a lot of oil. And once cradle cap is there, a uh, soft brush and washing their dandruff shampoo for one or two weeks is good enough for the therapy. So uh, I have taken 50 minutes. I'm sure uh, we are, will be having a lot of questions uh, for this. But what I really want to emphasize is that uh, we need to understand skin, which is not only... Uh, uh, which is uh, not only a physical barrier, it is also a microbe barrier. Barrier We need to do our practices, which improves the skin uh, uh, microbe and uh, thereby improving the immunomodulation infection prevention. We know that uh, we may be doing more harm by our traditional practices. So rationalize your practices. You need to update yourself for uniform evidence-based uh, normal neonatal skin care protocols within hospitals. Start convincing your uh, healthcare uh, facilities and the workers, the seniors that now WHO, Government of India is recommending bathing to be done in the hospital after using uh, good hand hygiene practices. Uh, immersion bathing or tub bathing is preferred. Uh, you need to teach them to the parents so that the same can be practiced at home. We need to understand that uh, skin assessment is should be an integral part of daily care plan. As we are always saying, IV site inflammation or not, you should also become a skin care, which should be done in all, especially in the NICUs. First neutral bath should, bathing should be performed within hospital, involving parents immediately following by, followed by immediate skin to skin contact with the mother. We are saying immersion bathing or tub bathing or shuttle bathing is preferred or traditional sponge bathing. You can use emollients uh, uh, in the uh, in the newborns, which have been shown to have a beneficial effect on skin barrier. Massage therapy, multi-sensory stimulation, they all have a positive impact on growth and development of children. And don't worry about the most of the neonatal skin conditions. They are transient. They require explanation to the parents. Parents will understand and then stop using other chemicals like povidone iodine, like uh, oils, sort of oils on the skin unnecessarily, especially in the scalp. Massage with coconut oil, which is okay, but oil should be that much only so it facilitates the movement of the hand. It's shown with so much that it restricts on the uh, body all the time. Don't uh, recommend uh, practices like use of kazal, use of uh, uh, upton, use of things on the umbilical stump, which all can harm. Powders, though there are no talc powder available, even coarse starch powders, we are not recommending as a routine. So whatever you are recommending, you should have a sound basis for that. All products are not bad. They are most of the products now in the market are okay. They are good, but they may not be required by most of the babies. So if a baby has a dry skin, definitely require a moisturizer. If baby needs a soap, definitely requires a soap of 5.5 pH. If baby requires a shampoo, definitely we can use shampoos in newborns. So if in selected situations, all these things are important. But routinely doing it for a very long period of time may not be beneficial. So with that, I hand over to Dr. Ajay and I will be very happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pangaj, for such a wonderful presentation. It was really practical uh, point of view from a pediatrician and neurologist. Uh, most of the queries, uh, though being answered by our uh, colleagues, Dr. Vidya Yadav and Dr. Deepika Yadav, uh, but most of the questions are related to either emollients, cleansing agents, shampoos. Uh, most of the queries are like that only. So can you name a few brand names uh, which uh, for the shampoo, for the cleansing agent, and uh, for the emollient person?
So I will say that uh, without naming uh, any no, these are not IAP recommendations, these are personal recommendations. Right. I'm saying that uh, with very lot of conviction. First of all, I don't recommend any herbal products. So I, I'm not against herbal or Ayurvedic products because I'm not trained to do that. I, have, I can see that a lot of uh, parents, uh, because of the cost constraint, they start using uh, Himalayan products or for that matter, Patanjali products or so herbal products. I'm not trained to look into their composition. So I don't recommend any products which are from Ayurveda or herbal because I don't know whether they are good or not. They may be excellent, but I don't know about them. So that is why I don't recommend. Number two, I, any good company which is there in the, on the platform these days, all good companies have good products. All of them are scientifically backed. And without uh, favoring anyone, whether it is Pizan or Medela or Johnson or Sivamed, all of them have good quality products which are evidence-based, which are approved by the drug controllers and the FSSI. So they are all good products. What I tell the parents is that you may not require them most of the time. If you're requiring them, try to use the same brand for all the products. Like if you're using one brand, use the soap of that brand, the lotion, the moisturizer, all the all these are available from all these companies which are good so without naming all these products are equally good if you require them so uh, that should be my answer but especially soaps people will definitely ask whether this one is better or that one is better but i tell them is that uh, the adult soaps are bad for children you use a baby soap 5.5 ph don't use soap very often just I recommend, though it is written two to three times, I always say bi-weekly. So be, let the baby bathe on Sunday because the parents are free. The father is also free. He also should be involved in whether baby's care and do it on Wednesday, Thursday. Only two times in a week you bathing the baby. For oil, coconut oil, which is a little warm from any company, virgin or no virgin does not make a difference, is good enough. You're on mute, I think. Ajay, you're on mute. Many parents use Figaro. Right. So <laughs> Figaro, basically, they're all they're all products. See, you have to, between oils, you differentiate whether it is a oil-based, it is a mineral oil-based, or it is a plant oil-based. So uh, mineral oils, because they are product of petrolet, petrolatum. So basically, something like diesel, petrol, mineral oils. They are mineral oils. They don't contain any allergen because they are coming from the uh, some the thousands and thousands uh, feet be beneath the air, beneath the earth. So they don't contain allergens. So that is the mineral oils. They are devoid of allergy, but they are expensive because ultimately petrol is expensive. People instead use plant oils. In that, there are a lot of plants are also available. Now, that is why we are saying that we are not promoting any particular product like whether it is Figaro. I'm sure a lot of people use olive oil. They got virgin olive oil. They get it imported from outside the country to say that we got this oil, which is good. Badam oil, lal tail oil, all these are used. And they have got very mixed type of composition. So as a pediatrician, I'm not able to understand whether this is good or that is good. So that is why I think we keep it simple that use Coconut oil, there's most studies are done on coconut oil. So I don't recommend Figaro for that matter because uh, it contains some uh, chemicals which may harm the baby. And those, no studies to back it up. Uh, Dr. Vidya and Dr. Deepika, you can uh, ask questions from the question answer box. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what is the safer age for starting massage? Right at birth, you can start massaging a full-term baby who is healthy with the mother. You can start doing it from day one, no problem. See, massage can be started at birth. It can be done. The studies have been done to do 15 minutes of massage five times in a day. Once people say that massage helps to weight gain, to improve growth, the studies have used it five times in a day. So that is what is important, 15 minutes, five times in a day. From day one, it can be started. There is no uh, issue. Yes, baby should be stable. Baby is not an uh, unstable condition. Stable baby massage is good for babies. Uh, yes, sir. Two, three questions are regarding what adhesive material should be used to stick the ET tubes. Right. I think this is important now. 
if you would apply the IT tube directly onto the skin, once you peel it off, the skin comes off. So now there are uh, skin adhesive tapes. Uh, I think uh, from uh, if I, I can name Tagadam is there. So it are very thin strips. So you apply it first. You dry the area, then you apply the thin strip, and then you apply, uh, fix it with endotracheal tube. What I don't recommend is use of Dynaplast. So if you're using Dynaplast, I'm sure all of us are using Dynaplast on the skin. So don't you really apply Dynaplast on the skin. Once you remove it, the skin will peel off. Use a Tagadam beneath, uh, which is uh, which is less uh, damaging. And then on the Dynaplast, on, on the Tagadam or on the thinner strip, on that you use a Dynaplast. So that your adhesion also remains and the nitrotical tube is secured. But at the same time, don't be in a hurry to remove it. Once you remove it with a with a force, skin comes off. Be very gentle. Uh, you can apply a little bit of uh, sterile water at that there and just gently uh, peel, uh, remove the uh, uh, dinoplast uh, and the adhesive uh, tape beneath, which is normally we use tagadam. And so, a lot of lot of questions are regarding the brand names of uh, pH neutral cleansers. PH neutral cleansers comes from Johnson's and Johnson's. They also come from uh, Pizen and Medela. Also, I think I, I'm not used, but I mainly use uh, Johnson's and it is available through Johnson's. Okay, thank you, sir. For the cradle cap. For the, for the cradle cap, you can use Spoo, which is a mild uh, shampoo, which is uh, anti dandruff shampoo. And if something is resistant to that, uh, because it's, I can discuss it here because ketoconazole shampoos, uh, though they say that ketoconazole in neonatal period is uh, not uh, something approved, but uh, uh, I have I've been using it for many, many years. If it does not help, uh, the spoo does not help, that means selenium uh, oxide does not help, ketoconazole can be used. So we are using so many medications in newborn, starting from meropinam and cholestine and piprasline, tazobactams. None of them are approved in newborns because nobody has done studies in newborns. So I don't think so. It's toxic to newborns. Only thing is that the, for approval, you need special uh, special permission to use it in newborn. That is why there's something against ketoconazole. But I think ketoconazole can be used and I can, I can invite comments from Dr. Vidya and Dr. Deepika on this because uh, I feel that uh, with no option left, ketoconazole is a good solution for these uh, cradle caps. Yes, sir, sir. There is another question. Do we uh, use neosprin powder uh, in care of umbil uh, umbilical cord? No, definitely not. So, first of all, neosporin is an antibiotic. So, why, why should we use antibiotic routinely? And now it's a powder. Powder will always stick on and pile up. So it will cause more granuloma, umbilical cord granuloma seen with this. And, and you may be colonizing the umbilical cord with resistant bacteria because you're using something prevent prophylactically. So I strongly say that don't use any powder and neosporin powder. At least I'll tell you from my experience, I have not used neosporin for last 25 years. So don't use it. It does not help. I believe uh, initially the powder used to contain some asbestos. That's why they were yes. banned. Yes. So the talc, talc powder had a asbestos content and asbestos was associated with some ovarian cancers in the female children because it was thought that it will be absorbed from there and maybe some vaginal contamination can happen. So asbestos, though that uh, claim, which is against Johnson, Johnson has been there in legal battle for many many years but ultimately they could nobody could prove it that it does that but as a matter of abundant precaution now nobody is uh, no good company is using talc so now they are all using cornstarch as a source of powder but even that uh, though asbestos is not there it cannot be it's a cornstarch it cannot be there in that but ultimately what we are trying to say is that powders are not important Powder sprinkling can harm. So that is why I'm sure pediatricians understand this, that uh, they are not using powders at all now. And if the parents are using, we always see that there's more the, in the skin folds, in the gluteal region, there are a lot of powder piles up and which leads to a lot of rashes. 
so that is why uh, powders should not be used as a routine if they really want to use it keep it little bit on the hand and then it can be rubbed gently dr pankaj please stop sharing your screen uh, many uh, delegates have asked about uh, umbilical granuloma right umbilical granuloma is preventable to a large extent if you take care of the umbilical cord with the uh, uh, no additional uh, application like neosporin powder which was mentioned or uh, other powders which are mentioned but yes sometime it happens umbilical cord granuloma normally starts appearing once the cord falls off and after a week two weeks the babies will come to you by the end of two to three weeks with the some umbilical granuloma my first tip is that infection especially in our part of the country is the biggest culprit from umbilical granuloma if you feel umbilical granuloma is there first week or 10 days you just apply alcohol wipe and if you feel some discharge is coming you can apply any antibacterial cream just let it dry off with a within a week 10 days most of the umbilical small granulomas will go inside the umbilical cord so in the umbilical cord it will go inside the skin will take care and nothing will be visible on the surface and that's it but if it is like cauliflower like it is still visible then definitely first step should be that smell it and just always see if there is any opening on the umbilical granuloma i have seen this and i have diagnosed at least five six patients in my practice in last 30 years in which there was an opening there and you can see the opening that means there is something abnormal whether it is persistent urethritis or it is persistent vitreointestinal duct if there is no opening and there is if you just swab it and smell it there is no urine smell no stool smell then it is a plain umbilical granuloma which is the commonest then you can apply, apply a silver nitrate stick i am sure that silver nitrate uh, sticks are commercially available you should know how to apply it there is very little of a silver nitrate apply it on on this on the umbilical granuloma and then you may have to repeat it one or two times more people have also used copper sulfate people have used salt on those all these things help because all of them are chemical bonds so by that i will say 99% will resolve within a month of age if still they don't resolve then very rarely you may require help of a, a surgeon to take care of it but uh, prevention antibacterial uh, practices for a week 10 days and then silver nitrate so all small so that we welcome dr alok bhandari sir president iip delhi गुड मॉर्निंग लोग सर आप तो शायद ड्राइविंग तो नहीं कर रहे हो डॉक्टर एनी मोर क्वेश्चन नो सर थैंक यू सो मोस्ट ऑफ द क्वेश्चंस आर आंसर्ड इफ दे स्टिल एनी मोर क्वेरीज विल पोस्ट देम इन द ग्रुप एंड आंसर देम लेटर देयर इज वन क्वेश्चन फॉर ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ न्यूनेटल एचएसवी neonatal hsv uh, herpes simplex virus uh, i have only seen one patient in my practice of so many years of neonatal hsv presenting and that also we could diagnose with the help of uh, the pcr based technology so if it is hsv and uh, it's not only the skin lesion it is also that child also had got some uh, uh, features with cystic of uh, encephalitis or meningitis then we did use uh, acyclovir in that patient but uh, it's a very very uncommon condition usually hsv whatever we see in practice uh, in in uh, books is seen more commonly in the western countries uh, i have very limited experience of using neonatal hsv in my practice dr vipul do you have any comments to me dr vipul thank thank you dr ajit i think uh, we can so, have a closing comments from dr alok complete camp tool on neonatology dermatology of neonatology in an hour yes. it's a really wonderful session amazing thank you dr uh, i would still like to add one thing ke this powder is still being written by 90% of neonatal units at least in delhi and we have been tired of stopping neonatal powder uh, yeah, neosporin powder in most of the neonates that we see it is invariably written in nine discharges out of 10 discharges i don't know from where it started and it is oh, so unhone na purani stamp banwa rakhi hai usi ko wo chhap dete 
I think that is that is our responsibility now to to talk to the pediatrician. So who has? I'm sure it is being done involuntarily without uh, really looking into this, just superficially uh, seeing. So I have started doing it and late because now I have become little senior over a period of time. Usually you are scared of your colleague that why what will you feel about it? But now lately I started doing it. That uh, you say that I saw this seen this practice this uh, description of yours. You written a viral fever and you prescribe two antibiotics daily. Do you feel need of it? So something like that, like neosporin powder, routinely is being prescribed by the hospital where the baby was born. Whether you still feel it's the right practice, something like that. Otherwise, this will never never stop. Uh, we have to very softly try to put forward our point that uh, whatever we feel right has to be explained. Otherwise, uh, if you look at people who attend the updates attend the conferences and they're all same people around 200 of them here and there what about the rest 2000 nobody talks to them they don't come to us we don't talk to them so uh, that's the only solution i think thank you sir dr alok sir any comments yes may i share an experience it is uh, most uh, most of the times the software which is doing these great things I'll have a personal experience that I prescribed vitamin D 0.5 ml once a day and one time I have once. Dr. Nidhi wants to say something. I think Dr. Alok has a network issue. Mrs. Shil, you can stop the YouTube now. I think for a one year link. तो वो अगली बार उसने कहा जगह कम है तो वंस अ डे आ दिया तो पॉइंट विटामिन ओनली वंस इट वाज करेक्टेड बट द सॉफ्टवेयर वाज कैरी अच्छा वंस सो इट वाज ऑलवेज इन अ नेक्स्ट पेशेंट अगेन इट वाज प्रिस्क्राइब दैट थैंक यू सर सो विद दिस वी कम टू दिस एंड ऑफ दिस वंडरफुल सेशन एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर जॉइनिंग एंड थैंक यू डॉक्टर पंकज डॉक्टर विद्या एंड डॉक्टर पीपीका फॉर हेल्पिंग अस and dr vipul is doing a great job of taking our technical uh, care uh, he is going to start with the ne next uh, round and thank you very much mrs shil please close the session so we all we should thank dr ajay gupta who has been the master or the main person behind this initiative and i'm sure it is benefiting i was seeing that maximum it was around 480 or something participants were there it's good uh, academic work which iip delhi is doing with the help of dr ajay and i'm sure